Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, 
Save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the third Sunday in Lent comes from Exodus chapter 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth, so that it may become gnats in all, of the, la all the land of Egypt. And they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth, and there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh, as he goes out to the water, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, let my people go, that they may serve me. Or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall happen. And the Lord did so. There came great swarms of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses. Throughout all the land of Egypt, the land was ruined by the swarms of flies. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, 
has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not associate with them, for at one time you were in dark you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Stand. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and abounding the holy gospel according to saint luke the 11th chapter now jesus was casting out a demon that was mute when the demon had gone out the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. While others, to test him, kept seeking from, high, from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and finding none. It says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. As he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, Blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and keep it. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Application, Lord God Almighty. See round your heart, love, 
hungry billows curling, see how your foes their banners are unfurling, and with great spite their fiery darts are hurling. Oh, Lord, preserve be our light when worldly darkness veils us. Lord, be our shield when earthly armor fails us. And in the day when hell itself assails us, grant us your peace. thoughts are raging, peace in our church, troubled souls are swaging, face when the world is, endless war is waging, peace in your Lord of our life and God of our salvation holds a dear place in my heart. More than once I've sang that hymn through tears, but that hymn has offered me so much comfort in times of trouble and struggle. I know every word of it by heart and I find myself singing it alone quite often, but it is such a comfort and a blessing to sing it together with you. Those words speak to our current lot in this world the hungry billows of smoke rising from the destruction wrought on us by sin, where our foes seem well equipped to march against the Christian church. And for us in our time and place, it seems to be more of a war against our ideas and our belief and our faith. But as we know, for many Christians across the world, those attacks are manifested by the sword. And I was thinking about this, that last week the world was rightfully outraged at those attacks that were carried out in New Zealand against the Muslim community there. And you most likely didn't miss this news story. There was a lot of attention given to that tragedy from people all over the world. And rightfully so, the world was outraged over the murders of those 49 people. Such a brazen attack of evil. It was clearly condemned by just about everyone. It was an attack that really stood out. It was different to hear about such an attack against a community by an outsider. And the world paid so much attention. They showed so much outrage and so much support for those who had suffered terribly. I offered up my own prayers for those families who were affected by that tragedy. I felt pain for what happened to them. I prayed for God to have mercy on us all and that somehow he could work through this, these circumstances to reveal the love of Christ to those who do not yet believe. But the prayers that I offer up for those victims, it was different than the prayer that I find myself praying so often. Praying for our brothers and sisters in the Christian church who continue to suffer under persecution across this wreck of a world. There was another story last week, one you may not have heard as much about, 52 Christian men, women, and children killed in the Daganoma and Mario Kajaru districts and villages of Nigeria. A hundred homes burned and destroyed. Of course, ABC sheepishly whispers this report behind the screams of injustice over the lives that were brutally taken at Christ Church, New Zealand. But the story faded. No international outrage, no continuous coverage, just a blurb about 52 dead Africans with no mention of the cause. And as tempted as I was to be outraged that, those, that voices were so silent regarding these Christian lives, I actually remembered this hymn. I thought about that third stanza as I think about this hymn a lot when I see something as horrible as this. That line that says, Lord, be our light 
when worldly darkness fails us. Be our shield when earthly armor fails us, and in the day when hell itself assails us, grant us your peace. I think about events like that one in Nigeria. I wish it was just an isolated incident. I wish it was something, I wish that was the sort of thing where the world would share my outrage, but the reality is this, that Christians being murdered is so typical it's barely even newsworthy. And all I can see when comparing these two outbursts of evil is that the devil does not give anyone in this world an easy go at things. Those poor folks in New Zealand, they were suffering on account of the world's sin. They too were facing the sting of death. This isn't just something that Christians have to face. Every living thing in the world eventually faces suffering and death. And as Christians, we are taught to pray for all who suffer, and even for those who would make us suffer. We pray for the Christians who suffer and die throughout the world with the hope that God would keep them in the blessing of faith, even to the point of their martyrdom. And also for those who do not yet know the word of Christ, we pray that all who are not of the faith would gladly hear and learn of this blessing that their suffering and dying may count for something good. We would pray that those who do not know the peace of Christ would believe God's word and cling to it. So my point to you is that I don't want you to be angry when the world doesn't share our outrage, when the world doesn't, when the world actually does what the world does. I want you to pray and I want you to have peace in the assurance of God, of Christ and his word and today in our gospel text, we're reminded of what we're up against in the world and why we Christians must pray. It starts with Jesus casting out a demon from the man who was silenced by an evil spirit, and it ends with Jesus proclaiming, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Now this reading comes to us from St. Luke as he shows us Christ's power over the demonic forces that have wreaked so much havoc over body and soul. This text reminds us also that the demons are not just some made-up character of mythology. They're not just some idea or concept about that represents human problems. They're not a picture of bad emotions or what have you. They're real. They seek our death, physical and spiritual. They're never satisfied to sit still and let our conscience have peace. And they are strong. But as we heard today, Christ is stronger. When Jesus refers to himself as the strong man, he presents himself to you as your refuge in every trouble, one to whom you can pray, praise, and even give thanks when it comes time to die. We like to get angry when the world hates the church. And when the world is unfair towards the church, when the world would kill Christians, when the world won't say anything about those children who were killed with machetes last week in Nigeria just because they cling to the blessing of the word of Christ. But our Lord teaches us to avert our, ourselves from this anger, and he teaches us to cling to his word. It's that same word that even he teaches us from the cross, even as he prays for his own enemies, for, his, for those who are putting him to death. By his own example, he shows us how he wants us to hear the word, how he wants us to keep it, how he wants us to pray for our enemies and to pray for the peace that preserves the church in all circumstances. We often talk about the word of God as Christians we know that the word of God covers the whole field of God's revelation of himself. Jesus reveals his divinity in both word and in deed in the reading that we hear today from the Bible. Jesus was casting out the demons. And what he did, it made people marvel. The people who saw him do this, they knew instinctively that what was happening could only happen if God was present and working through this man at the very least. It was simply so good that it touched the people who witnessed it and that those who were Jesus' adversaries, they were troubled by it and they tried to spin what Jesus does in a negative light. 
They suggest very boldly that Jesus was in league with the devil. After all, who had ever seen anything like that before? Sure, they had exorcists at work in their time, but no one was that effective. Not immediately so like this Jesus. His very success was suspicious to them. At least that was the seed that they wanted to plant in everybody else's mind. And they plant that seed. Their plan seemed to have worked on some folks. People were wondering and some began to demand some sort of sign from heaven that would assure them that he was not demonic but heavenly. And of course those people may have been part of the conspiracy against Jesus from the get-go, but it sure does make for effective theater. That sort of talk can spread like cancer. Even innocent people can get caught up in it and affected by it. So Jesus answers these far-fetched charges with simple reason. He says, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. I mean, it is general principle that people recognize as usually valid. The flip side is that old axiom of divide and conquer. But Jesus applies it. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? With those two sentences, Jesus has put to rest the suggestion of his adversaries and the suspicions that they raised. The devil is not at work against himself, and they could see that the kingdom of pain and trouble wasn't shaken. Then Jesus goes on the offense. He says, for you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul, and if, I ca and if by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? Consequently, they shall be your judges. But then he says, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Beelzebul is the king of the demons, another name for Satan. Jesus says that if I'm doing exorcisms by being in league with Satan, then what are you saying about those among you whom none of you challenge, whom you even send to people when they're in trouble and possessed, who are also exorcising such demons? I mean, it was commonly thought and known that only God could drive out a demon, and that the devil comes to confuse and to destroy, not to cleanse and to bless. But the next phrase Jesus uses is about, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, it's not really an if statement. It is the only option that is left and open to us. Unless they're going to admit that their whole religious enterprise is deliberately misleading and evil, Jesus tells them what it means. That the kingdom of God, the hoped for condition of the Messiah, the kingdom that he would bring about it's here. It's arrived. The time has come. That, of course, also means that Jesus is the Messiah, although he didn't have to use so many words to say that. Jesus tells a parable about casting out demons in terms of a strong man, one who is guarding his house, and one stronger than him coming and throwing him out, distributing the plunder. That's what Jesus was doing. And it's a good picture of the devil being conquered by the Lord. Because Jesus speaks a word of solemn warning and judgment, saying, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. He shows us that there's only two positions possible, and there is no such thing as neutrality. Either you are actively working with the Lord, or you serve the devil. Even inaction and neutrality means you were taking a side. You were deliberately and affirmatively on God's side, or you are the enemy of Jesus and of God. Then Jesus describes his own people with another parable. He speaks of Israel when he describes the man from whom the unclean spirit is driven out. That those who reject Jesus are the unclean spirit that finds the house all cleaned, put in good order, and then goes out and finds seven more spirits, more foul than itself, the language says. It is Israel, Israel that Jesus is describing when he says that the last state is worse than the first. He's 
personifying Israel as a man, which is something God does throughout the Old Testament. And he's saying that when his cleansing is done, they, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and so forth, they wreak havoc and ruin on Israel by rejecting their own Messiah. But one woman in the crowd responds to Jesus, and it comes about while he says these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. Now those words are true enough, but Jesus says, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it, observe it. Now Jesus is certainly worthy of that praise, and we also seek to praise him with our whole heart. But Jesus meant to turn the attention of that woman and everyone else in the crowd, including you and me, to the blessedness that is found and to see what it is comprised of. Jesus' weird response to this woman and this wonderful saying that she throws out in the crowd is essentially, go to the word and pay attention to that, folks. Jesus tells us to ignore everything but the word of God, to pay close attention to that and to decide everything by that word. What he is saying is perfectly in accord with everything that he has said and done in this text this morning. Jesus was demonstrating first and then teaching clearly that the kingdom of God is here. The time has come. He says, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The question is, was Jesus casting out demons? And the answer is yes. Was he doing it by the power of God? Yes. Again, the answer is yes. And so we're left to conclude here that indeed the kingdom of God has come upon us. Unless you want to say that God has abandoned us since then. Of course, that means the word of God understood according to its intended sense. We've talked about twisting scriptures about using them contrary to their meaning. Of course, that comes up quite often. We talk about the devil doing just that and the temptation of Jesus when we heard that text two weeks ago. That in this we are urged to spend time learning what the word of Christ says, to be able to spot a spiritual counterfeit just as surely as the banker needs to spot a counterfeit bill or that a bartender needs to spot a fake ID. You need to know the word of God. Remember that bit of scripture, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. True blessedness means that we know the word and that we live in light of it. Living out what, by for, what that forgiveness God has now given us, what that means, even in our day-to-day -day life. If we were living in heaven, how would that change us in the way that we live today? Well, that change would be evident already because you are living in heaven. Your flesh is not living in heaven, but you are. You stand as one of God's chosen and favorite people. You have eternal life, and Christ has lifted the burdens of the law from your shoulders along with the power of darkness. Your sins are forgiven. All you have to be concerned about is living in this freedom and walking in complete trust toward God because you are living in the new kingdom, his kingdom, and he loves you. But what, all, what does all of this mean in connection with our very real life, the one we still find ourselves trudging through in a very real world where tragedies just seem to abound? Well, let's work that problem backwards. First, what is the will of God for you? It's your salvation. And how is that accomplished? By grace through faith. Faith, faith is the hand that receives the blessing that God pours out on you in his grace and love so that when you know the word of God, you know what God wants you to believe. He wants you to believe this blessing to trust in him, to take him at his word wherever he offers it to you, 
The first great work done by a believer is actually believing itself. And I say that it's a great work because it's beyond our human ability to do. God has to create that work in us through the hearing of the word, which is just another reason why we must attend to the word, to the preaching of the word, to the study of the word, to the devotional reading of that word, where the word tells us about our forgiven sins, how Jesus died on the cross so that we might have everlasting life by grace through faith, This is where we are granted peace in our hearts where those sinful thoughts keep raging. It's where he offers peace to the church, our troubled souls assuaging, peace when the world its endless war is waging, peace in God's heaven. All we need is already done. Just take God at his word. It's a trusting that love and that providence of God day to day It's such a challenge. The pains mount up, the troubles roll about around us. We know that blessedness also includes repenting, confessing our sins, because the word says plenty about our sinfulness. And we repent because we have the promise. We have that gracious and precious promise of God that says if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, which just confirms in us the state of true blessedness that's already ours in Christ. God is faithful in that he forgives us every time we confess, and he is just to do so because Jesus has already paid the price. He's already redeemed us, bought us back from our sin, from death, from hell. True blessedness is faith. So hear the word of God, as Jesus says, and do what he tells you to do. Gather, don't scatter. Hope, don't despair. Trust in God. Don't fear life and what's going on in the world around us. Don't fear persecution. Even pray for your enemies. Set your values and your attitudes by the word and not by the world around you. I mean it when I say I think people would be so much happier if they would just unplug their television. Just think if we all did that, if we clinged that much to the word, if we looked so forward, if we made it the high point of our week to take and eat and drink so often his holy supper where he gives us the word attached to the element saying, I love you, your sins are forgiven. Here's the food of eternal life. And we would love one another as Christ has loved each one of us, to listen to the word, to observe it, to keep it, to believe it, and then to do it. That's blessedness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. amen. Let us stand and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again with the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, 
who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the eyes of all the faithful to be ever turned toward the Lord and that they would see him in his holy word and sacraments receive his grace and mercy, and walk as children of the light. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Matthew, our synod president, Roger, our district president, Mark, our circuit visitor, and all pastors in Christ, that they would be steadfast in their proclamation of repentance and the forgiveness of sins in Christ's name. Let us pray to the Lord. For our congregation, that we would be content in the Lord's gracious provisions, kept from greed and covetousness, and filled with generosity in support of the Lord's work among us and abroad, let us pray to the Lord. For those who suffer from the world's violence, teach your children to trust in your blessedness. Give them strength to endure persecution that even in death they may proclaim the forgiveness of sins and the life everlasting, one for us in Jesus. And for those who suffer and do not yet know the hope of true blessedness, grant them hearts receptive to your unending mercy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who suffer with physical and mental ailments, that they would be given the strength to endure their afflictions, the grace to remember the Lord's steadfast love for them and the relief that they need. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who partake of the Holy Supper of Christ's very body and blood this day, that their sins would be forgiven, their faith strengthened, and their hearts stirred up to walk in love. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who have gone before us in the faith and now rest from their labors, let us give thanks to the Lord that we would abide in Christ until we too are called from this veil of tears and that we would with them enter into the eternal kingdom Christ will usher in on the last day. Let us pray to the Lord. We lay these petitions before your throne of grace, O Father, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of heaven, and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, 
he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Welcome to the table of the Lord. Take and eat the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ given into death for you. Take and eat the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ given into death for you. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink. The true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ Strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Go in peace. Amen. Welcome to the table of the Lord. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. Take and eat. The true body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. The body of Christ given into death for you. Take and eat. The body of Christ given for you. Take and eat the true body of our Lord Jesus Christ given to death for you. Take and eat the body of Christ. And may the Lord, by His Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you in the one true faith to life everlasting. Go in peace. Amen. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. May the Lord, by His Holy Spirit, bless you and keep you the one true faith to life everlasting. Go in peace. Amen.
Now you let your servant go. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people. A light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Saving man. 